In this episode, we look at the effects of social media on our mental health. Get excited because this is Tiny Leaps. Big Welcome to another episode of Tiny Leaps, Big Changes, where I share simple strategies you can use to get more out of your life. My name is Greg Clunas, and in this episode, uh, we are looking at the effects of social media on our mental health. We're going to be doing this uh, a little bit old school, a little bit how the show sort of originally was, where we're looking at a few different articles, a few different resources on sort of what they've found to be true about this. And then I'm going to be sort of providing my interpretation of the, the, the section from that article or my opinion on on how we can sort of mitigate this. So this should be a pretty interesting one because this is a topic that I know a lot of you are uh, curious about, you're struggling with yourself, you're wondering about, and uh, I, I think that if more people understood this, uh, myself included, that we could all sort of get the benefits of social media because there are a lot uh, without all the drawbacks. So this should be a really good one for that. Now, before we jump into the episode, be sure to take the survey. If you haven't already, head over to www.tinyleaps.fm slash survey. Uh, your answers will help me to create better episodes for the rest of this year to create better content to serve you better and help you in your goals. And you have a chance to win one of three $50 gift cards. So head over to www.tinyleaps.fm slash survey and take that when you have a moment. So what are the effects of social media on our mental health? I've got two sources here, two different articles that I think really uh, have, have sort of dove into the research on this. So the first one comes from the UK Center for Mental Health. You can find their website at centerformentalhealth.org.uk or click the link in the description of this episode. And their article uh, tries to sort of look at the effects of social media on teens and on uh, uh, young adults. So young people is sort of the focus of the studies that they looked at through. And this article, I wanted to pull one specific section. I read through the full thing and I wanted to pull out this one specific section because I think it really highlights uh, what many of us sort of have always feared, right? So that section says, quote, so-called social media addiction has been referred to by a wide variety of studies and experiments. It is thought that addiction to social media affects around 5% of young people and was recently described as potentially more addictive than alcohol and cigarettes. Its addictive nature owes to the degree of compulsivity with which it is used. The urge to check one's social media may be linked to both instant gratification or the need to experience fast short-term pleasure and dopamine production or the chemical in the brain associated with reward and pleasure. The desire for a hit of dopamine coupled with a failure to gain instant gratification may prompt users to perpetually refresh their social media feeds. What is dangerous about this compulsive use is that if gratification is not experienced, users may internalize beliefs that this is due to being unpopular, unfunny, etc. A lack of likes on a stat a lack of likes on a status update may cause negative self-reflection, prompting continual refreshing of the page in the hope of seeing that another person has enjoyed the post, thus helping to achieve personal validation. Although these perceptions may not actually reflect one's image in the eyes of others, the absence of gratification may amplify feelings of anxiety and loneliness. A recent study conducted by the OECD, for instance, found that those who use social media more intensively on average had lower life satisfaction. End quote. Now, the big takeaway here, right? The, the summary of this sort of section is very straightforward. Social media is addicting. I think we all know that. We've all sort of felt that. We've all been uh, sitting around and just compulsively reach at our phone or we're doing something else. And before we know it, we're on Facebook or Instagram or Twitter or, or Snapchat or whatever thing you use. Um, and the big 
reason for this addiction is because every single time that we get a like or we see something that we like and that we enjoy, we are triggering something in the brain to say, hey, here's some dopamine, here's some dopamine, here's some dopamine, here's some dopamine. And that feels good. That feels like a, a nice experience. So we want to recreate it over and over and over again. And that's why we sort of naturally reach for the phone. It has become a dopamine engine or a button or whatever analogy you want to use, I guess. Like it is a source of dopamine for us. Now, when that dopamine is not hit when we don't get that when we check the account and no one has liked the photo or when we post something and no one cares we only have one real way to justify it right like we're not like the only thing that we can do to justify why no one has liked that photo is think oh it's not a good photo and if it's a photo of yourself then all of a sudden those feelings transfer to feelings about us. It's a purely emotional response, but that's how we add logic to it, right? That's the logical decision. That's the logical path. If no one liked the photo, that means no one likes me. And that's the true danger. It's dangerous that we are relying on these devices, these things, to give us dopamine basically on command and it's dangerous that when we don't get that hit we tend to internalize it and come up with very emotional and often wrong reasons why that might be the case and then we internalize that belief about ourselves and over a period of time that creates this very warped image of who we are compared to who everyone else is. So that's the first big section that I wanted to look at. The second is from a website called SciComm.net, and it goes as follows. Quote, one study out of the University of Pittsburgh, for example, found a correlation between time spent scrolling through social media apps and negative body image feedback. Those who had spent more time on social media had 2.2 times the risk of reporting eating and body image concerns compared to their peers who spent less time on social media. The participants who spent the most time on social media had 2.6 times the risk. Results from a separate study from the University of Pittsburgh School of Medicine showed that the more time young adults spent on social media, the more likely they were to have problems sleeping and report symptoms of depression. And another small study of teens ages 13 through 18 from the UCLA Brain Mapping Center found that receiving a high number of likes on photos showed increased activity in the reward center of the brain. Further, teens are influenced to like photos regardless of content based on high numbers of likes. Bottom line, it feels good to be liked and herd mentality is big on social media. Like what others like and you're in. Let's repeat that last line. Herd mentality is huge on social media. If you like what others like, you're in the tribe. So let's look at this last section as a whole here. People who spend more time on social media are more likely to have body image issues. Why is this? Because social media is largely fake. Because the idea of authenticity on social media is engineered. It's not real life. Now, we all know this logically. I think society has gotten to a place where we understand this, but that doesn't mean that subconsciously it's not still affecting us. When we scroll through and our photos don't get likes, but then this other person who photoshops their photos does get likes, all of a sudden we think they're prettier than us. We think they're better than us. We think they're funnier than us because they got likes. There's the proof right there. It's hard to argue with on the surface. And so we internalize that feeling and we start to have issues with our own body and we think we should look like that person or that person or that person or we should buy this thing because this person has it. And that's one of the biggest dangers here because not only if we look at that first study, that first uh, section rather, not only does our own inability, quote unquote, to gain likes on our content, our photos lead to poor self-image, poor understanding of, of who we are in relation to everyone else, poor uh, uh, 
reactions and sort of internalizing negative feelings towards ourself. Not only does when our own content fails, uh, failing do that to us, also, when we look at other people's content, it does that to us. And so you get this scenario where anything you do on social media leads to feeling bad about yourself. But then we all spend hours on it. I use this um, this tool on my phone to track time spent on social media. And not so much now, but in the past, I've spent eight hours on different social media. And I'm sure many of you have as well. If you have the app, try it. See it for yourself. So what's the big, big takeaway here? What can we learn from both of these sections? Social media is not an inherently bad thing. But humans, when they are mixed with the environment that social media creates, does create bad results. We tend to internalize uh, negative feelings about ourselves if there is no external validation. And also, when someone else gets external validation, we tend to internalize negative feelings about ourselves. We tend to compare ourselves to them, even if we logically know that that environment isn't real. That thing that they shared was photoshopped. We still look at it and feel like, oh, well, why don't I look like that? Why don't I have that? Why, why is my life so crap compared to theirs? And then we start feeling like we're missing out on something and we should be out. Like it, it's just a negative cycle. So while social media does have its positives, i.e. being able to connect with anyone around the world, being able to see stories from people all over the world, uh, uh, allowing us to reconnect with people in our lives that we've missed, allowing us to keep in touch with people when they move away. Social media has many, many benefits. In fact, social media built this podcast. It allowed you to find me in a lot of ways, or at least the internet it. There are many benefits to it, but be living in that world isn't good for us. It's not a good place to spend as much time as we spend. So how do we reduce that? How do we mitigate that? Well, there's four pieces of advice that I'd like to share from an article on medicalexpress.com. Again, links for all of these are in the description of this episode. Number one, is to move social media apps off of your home screen. Having this extra step to open them can reduce the urge to check social media as soon as you get on your phone. Basically, if you've got to work for it, you're less likely to do it. So if you make it harder for yourself to open social media, you'll end up naturally spending less time on it and therefore gaining more of the positives without all the negatives. Number two is to schedule specific times to check social media or set a timer to limit yourself to 20 or 30 minutes. Now, if you have a smartphone, I know for a fact iPhones at the very least have the ability to lock you out of apps when you want it to. So you can set the limit for yourself for that day. And once you're done, every time you open it, it'll tell you that you can't go in. Now, if you don't have an iPhone, Androids have apps that will make this possible as well. Just do a quick Google search and you'll find many recommendations on tools that will allow you to block or limit the amount of time you spend on various social media apps. Number three is to put your phone on silent. When we aren't hearing a tone or vibration every time we get a notification, we're less likely to get distracted. And this is true. Every single time your phone buzzes or beeps or, or plongs or whatever it does, that's a signal. That is your brain hearing that and thinking, oh, need to do this. If you've ever heard of the, the Pavlov's dog experiment, right? So he trained dogs to salivate every time they heard a bell ring over the course of whatever period of time, simply by giving them food and tying it to the sound of the bell ringing so that once the food was removed, the bell ringing still caused the effect, all right? That happens with our phones. Every time we hear that notification, we are trained to pick up the phone. We are trained to open the app. We're trained to go see what that is. It is an instantaneous reaction. If we turn that sound off, we gain back more control over what's going on. And number four is to take a break from social media or limit the number of apps you use. Try sticking to apps that you use the most to communicate with people. So this one is pretty interesting. I'm a big fan of taking a break every now and then. Uh, obviously, when you're on vacation, that's a great time. But even if you're not, just delete all your apps for two days, three days, one day. I think you'll find that just by limiting your exposure to the thing, 
that that thing that is sort of triggering your addiction and keeping you addicted to it, that you'll be in a much better position to navigate it when you do use it. So again, all of the resources for this episode are in the description for the episode. All you have to do is click the link in the description. I hope this was helpful to somebody out there. This is uh, advice that I'm going to be taking myself this year because I do want to reduce the amount of time I spend on social media. Um, So I hope that it helps you as well or someone in your life. Be sure to click subscribe wherever you're tuning in. And if you know someone that this episode would benefit, share it with them. Just tell them to listen to this episode. It, It should be able to help. I've been Greg Clunas. Thank you so much for listening. And remember that all big changes come from the tiny leaps you take.